This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Pop quiz, what does this scene have in common with this one? The first is a terrifying scene from The Haunting of Hill House, Netflix's iconic horror series from 2018, a show about the ghosts and emotional wounds that our deepest traumas cause. The other is from the second season of the equally iconic RuPaul's Drag Race, a vibrant and irreverent show about celebrating flamboyant personalities. These two shows could not possibly be any more different, but they were both edited by the same man, a man who has become one of the preeminent names in the horror genre, Mike Flanagan. Before he went on to become a writer-director, Flanagan worked as a reality TV editor as he tried to find his way into the industry, and his knack for editing is a skill set that's apparent in all of his best work. Flanagan has long since left his days of reality TV editing behind, and today is a Netflix institution unto himself, churning out one beloved horror series after another, Haunting of Bly Manor, Midnight Mass, and his most recent Netflix series, The Midnight Club. Netflix.com even has a whole page dedicated to the Flaniverse, breaking down where all his most frequent collaborators have appeared. Personally, I prefer the term Flanagana Bonanza, but... It, it hasn't caught on. You might be surprised to hear me even talk about Mike Flanagan and editing together. Hill House is possibly most famous for its sixth episode, an impossible one-take shot that spans multiple locations and time periods. But Mike Flanagan contains multitudes, clearly. His style is very recognizable even while being made up of all sorts of different things. There is a pretty consistent color palette filled with muted green blues and accented with warm yellow-orange candlelight colors. There are the recurring actors, always recognizable despite being cast in wildly different roles. There are his long, slow zooms that let actors really showcase monologues of dialogue. There's a thematic focus on trauma and grief. There's whatever you call this shot, and there are even nods to his other shows all over his work. I, um, I loved Riley. I loved Aaron. They were great. But it's one thing to recognize these aesthetic choices and another to understand how these elements work together. How do Flanagan's themes and tools match each other to amplify the stories he tells? How does his background in editing influence his work and make it stronger? And why does it all work so well for TV? In 90 minutes, you can get away with scaring people three or four times. Get back in the car! <laughs> for something like this, over 10 hours, the rules are very different. When you think about film editing in the horror genre, you probably think about one thing first. Jump scares. While Mike Flanagan is certainly an expert at hitting audiences with an unexpected horrific image, The Midnight Club set the Guinness World Record for jump scares in its first episode at 21, that's not the only thing that makes him a great horror editor. Wait. Don't be lazy. You scared? Startled isn't the same as scared. Anyone can bang pots and pans behind someone's head. That's not scary, it's just startling. To understand Flanagan's talent for editing and how it's much more than just a well-timed scare, we have to think about the unique challenges that TV presents for the genre. Watch any horror movie and you can feel the story build to a crescendo of tension and fear over the course of two-ish hours. On TV, though, there's a challenge to building tension the same way. If you make 10 individual one-hour movies that follow that structure, your show can start to become repetitive, and episodes can feel disconnected from each other. But if you go the other way and you make one 10-hour long movie, you run the risk of taking too long to build up or being tense for too long. Both are problems. Nobody wants to wait seven hours for something to happen, and nobody wants to hang out with the opening scene of 28 weeks later for 10 hours straight because 
you'll you'll die. You you can't you can't survive. It's too intense. So what do you do on TV? How do you make sure that your premise both doesn't run stale and doesn't burn out too fast? Well, you do what every other TV creator has done since the beginning of time. You focus on characters. He has a really unique way into horror. It's very true to the genre, but he will always go for a more complex character and a deeper version of something. Building out a number of well-crafted characters gives you the opportunity to build tension at different paces for different characters. Viewers aren't just wondering what thing will jump out at them in the next spooky scene, but are drawn into each character's story, learning what specific things scare them, living their ghosts with them, and seeing how they play off other characters. We've all been dealing, and, and we somehow managed not to try to fuck each other's hey, spouses. Hey, that's not what this was about. It just isn't. So, you were drunk, and that's supposed to be okay? I'm telling you. I'm trying to tell you. I don't you. need to hear your excuses. I'm not and that's when he gets you. <laughs> to highlight this difference between TV and film, let's look at Flanagan's 2013 film Oculus and compare it to The Haunting of Hill House. They're actually remarkably similar stories. Both focus on adults looking back at trauma from their childhood. In both stories, the central characters have seen their parents destroyed by ghostly possession, and in both stories, when they try to fight the monsters from their past, they experience a melding of time. I pitched it as kind of a follow-up to Oculus. It, it, it's really, um, I had said at one point it's Oculus, but it goes to 11. It, it's generational trauma and two timelines braided together. Um, and siblings dealing with something that may or may not have, you know, destroyed their parents, and it's, it's Oculus. But here's the difference between Oculus and The Haunting of Hill House. Oculus is only 103 minutes. It's over halfway through the second episode of Hill House. It has just two characters with pretty simple backstories. The movie is about the premise, a haunted mirror that can warp your sense of reality if you're nearby, making you see whatever it wants you to, and the film quickly becomes a surreal, time-bending shop of horrors. This is a trick to get us back inside. This is a trick to keep us standing there. While Hill House uses the same ideas when it comes to telling a story across multiple timelines and even features the same mirror, it is much more focused on its characters than its premise. The first five episodes of Hill House are actually a lot like one of my favorite TV shows, Lost. They both provide us a look into the past and present of an individual character, allowing us to grow closer to the characters than the present day plot alone might allow. Those characters are way more fleshed out, each given their own unique backstory and relationship with the ghosts of the house. And it's in balancing these characters that Flanagan's background in editing really shines. Thank you, I love it. Mom? <laughs> Thank you, I love it. Mom? Mommy? This happens dozens of times in Hill House. Flanagan shows us one character's point of view in a scene, and then sometimes episodes later will reveal the other character's perspective, giving new meaning to their interaction and exploiting the scene for tension from two different directions. Hi, this is Nell. Please leave a message after the beep. It's Steve. I'm sorry I missed your call. episode that Flanagan is credited with personally editing in Hill House is the first, although he edited every episode of Midnight Mass and half of Bly Manor. But you can see his eye for editing at work in the way he directs and writes scenes. As he told creativescreenwriting.com, every step I take, and when I sit down to write or when I'm on set coming up with how to approach the scene, I'm only thinking about the edit. It completely affects my shortlisting process and in my scene breakdowns on set. It changes how I deal with actors, because I'm thinking entirely about the edit. One day, I'll wake up and it'll be 
too late. Stay the to... fuck out of my business. There it is. Stuck your hand. Right in the fan. Fucking fan. You see, Steve? I didn't let the mold guy do the whole job, so he gave me some busted fans. Flanagan writes in these kinds of edits for all sorts of scenes. He'll use it to toggle between characters. Mom. Mom, wait. What's wrong? Mom, stop. I don't want you going back there ever again. What? That is not my church. That is not the man I knew. Martha. That is not the man I knew. Other times it matches the present of a character with their past, mimicking a memory. The fuck, Steve. You didn't like it. And still other times he uses it to do both simultaneously. Here's an example from Bly Manor. Miss Jessel found herself as she walked the grounds of Bly for the first time, wishing that she might never leave. We toggle from the backstory of the previous au pair Rebecca Jessel to the current present day story of Danny, drawing a clear parallel between the two characters across time. These time spanning edits aren't just aesthetic choices either, they're foundational to the ghost stories at the heart of Bly Manor and Hill House. Cutting between characters brings us more intimately into their perspectives, and jumping between timelines lets us feel the weight of their past trauma on their present selves. I really wanted to play more with ghosts as an expression of emotional wounds that we do carry around. How the past and present can echo each other, that moments don't fall like dominoes, they fall like confetti. Of course, Mike Flanagan isn't reinventing the wheel here. Many horror films have used ghosts and monsters as metaphors for trauma, grief, and other uncomfortable emotions. They'll use monsters to represent the things that terrify us, forcing the audience to confront things that they didn't even know that they were afraid of. Flanagan is doing that, yes, but in part because of the length of his stories, he can't just present the metaphor. He has to meaningfully grapple with it. It doesn't take much analysis from the audience to figure out what Flanagan characters are haunted by. In fact, it's often made pretty explicitly clear over the course of the series. But that lets the show push deeper. It's not just depicting fears and grief, but also depicting grappling with them in meaningful ways. Ghosts morph over the course of his shows, not just to be confronted and defeated, but also to be accepted and forgiven. Ghosts are guilt, ghosts are secrets, ghosts are regrets and failings. But most times, most times a ghost is a wish. Flanagan's shows never feature a race to destroy some artifact that ties a ghost to the physical plane. His ghosts are rarely banished, instead learned from and sympathized with. This is because ghosts for Flanagan aren't external forces we can run from, but internal sources of shame, guilt, and fear that are a part of us. The result is that his shows have an almost meditative quality to them. Characters are haunted by their trauma, decode that haunting, and then have to confront it in a meaningful way for themselves. Perhaps nowhere is this more apparent than in Midnight Mass. Unlike Hill House, Bly Manor, and The Midnight Club, Midnight Mass isn't really a ghost story in the way we generally think about them. Riley is the only character who's haunted. He's the only one who sees a ghost, the memory of a woman he killed while driving drunk. <laughs> Flanagan has called Midnight Mass his most personal work, drawing not just from his upbringing as an altar boy in a small Catholic town, but also upon his personal fear that before he got sober, he might accidentally kill someone. Back in the days when I drank, there were times where I felt like the consequences weren't going to apply to me. The difference between Riley and so many of us is that he happened to be in that split second in a position where there was a direct and fatal consequence to someone else. And for me, that was always the really scary thing. Midnight Mass is probably considered the least frightening of Flanagan's works, instead being more famous for its long soliloquies about the nature of faith and doubt, written in ways only possible for someone who has profoundly experienced both. See, that that's the part. I cannot swear. Because you're right, there is 
There's so much suffering in the world, so much. And then there's this higher power, this higher power who could erase all that pain, just wave his hand and make it all go away, but doesn't? No. No, thank you. Faith and doubt are themselves things that have clearly haunted Flanagan. And like Hill House and Bly Manor, the show is deeply interested in death and pain and how they are inevitable parts of life. Even out of blackness, love rises again. One day at a time is what we've got. It's what everybody's got when you get down to it. Whatever that life is, we bear witness. It's a horror. It doesn't have to be. Faith, like a ghost, is a wish. What scares us most is the unknown. If you want to know why or how God's will shapes the world, brothers and sisters, so do I. I don't have all the answers. Nobody does. What I do have, though, and what God gives us plentifully are mysteries. As adults, we tend to dislike mysteries. We, we, we feel uncomfortable not knowing. This is why movie monsters remain hidden for so long, and I think it's also why we're so scared of death. But on Midnight Mass, the only thing more terrifying than not knowing the answers are the people who think they have them. Yeah, that's where religion comes from. That's the whole question. It is. What happens when we die? What the fuck happens? So what do you think? What happens when we die, Riley? I don't know. And I don't trust anyone who tells us they do. While faith is certainly a central tenet of Midnight Mass, the show is also incredibly critical of the hypocrisy it finds at the center of the church. Without giving too much away, uh, a literal reading of the Bible does not provide salvation to the island's inhabitants. Even when a literal reading maps pretty well onto exactly what's happening. Instead, the show portrays multiple faiths, multiple interpretations of what happens when we die, from Islam to atheism without co-signing any of them. It upholds the value of faith in something, so long as you understand that we can never know for sure. And it's in the discomfort between these opposing but valid forces that Flanagan's TV shows really thrive. They're about finding what scares us most, but they're also about embracing that fear. I think it's that wonderful connection between a great love story and a great ghost story. The two are really the same thing, how each of us when we fall in love is kind of giving birth to a new ghost, something that's going to follow us for the rest of our lives. It's strange to think of these opposites as the same thing, but it's an idea at work all over Flanagan's shows. Hill House blurs the lines between dreams and reality, between the safety of home and the danger of a haunted house. Bly Manor blurs the lines between love and horror, its scariest moments created by the deepest of loves. Midnight Mass blurs the lines between skepticism and faith, between death and an eternal afterlife. At the center of all of this is what makes Flanagan's horror truly unique, the juxtaposition of deep trauma and optimism. For Flanagan, it's important to look into the eyes of what terrifies you and to try to understand it, to come to terms with it, because running from it is what turns it into a haunting. One of the things that I believe is that our lives are full of ghosts. I think they take a lot of forms and they can be regrets and memories and shame and grief and guilt and all sorts of things. For an audience, it's about forcing them to look at things that are uncomfortable in the safe space that the genre creates. Some have argued that Flanagan's work isn't exactly horror. Outside of Hill House, it's not always terribly frightening. Some of his adaptations have also drawn criticism for misunderstanding or erasing queer subtexts. Others have felt that his work is a betrayal to the genre itself. As Vox's Asia Romano writes, horror validates our fears of climate crisis, social meltdown, existential collapse. It reminds us that we're not alone in being afraid, and crucially, it doesn't bother with false comfort. Maybe Flanagan's evolving TV style isn't horror, TM. It isn't nearly as bleak as some of his early films, like Oculus. Perhaps some of that is due to the limitations of the medium. TV is often about happy endings, even for the darkest of shows. But I don't think I would describe Flanagan's style of humanistic horror as false comfort. I don't think it's about waving away your fears, but instead about learning from them and to live with them. I wanted very much to try to tell a story 
wherein I would authentically try to inhabit both perspectives that exist within me. Giving weight to both perspectives is a delicate balancing act to pull off, weighing the opposing forces of cynicism and hope. But if there's one guy who can pull it off, it's the guy who has the range to do this, <laughs> and also this. Now, say you did want to run from your fears, and let's just say your biggest fear is a lack of privacy online. Well, let me introduce you to this video's sponsor, NordVPN. When you surf the internet, you don't really have any privacy. Any website you go to can see who and where you are, and the company you pay for service can track that data too. But NordVPN can encrypt your ISP so you can wander around the internet like a little ghost. That's right, no need to be afraid of ghosts because you are one now and you didn't have to die or anything. NordVPN doesn't just hide your data, it also hides your location. So when you go to, I don't know, Netflix, where all those Mike Flanagan shows are, you can access movies or TV that might not be available in your location. A lot of times, Netflix distributes American shows to other countries under the banner of Netflix Original. But by powering up NordVPN and using it to tell Netflix you're in a different place, you can get access to them without a cable subscription. It's also very affordable and something that I use all the time. Plus, they have a 30-day money-back guarantee if you want to just binge all those shows and get out of Dodge. You can get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount by going to nordvpn.com slash skip intro or clicking the link in the description. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. And thank you so much for watching. Give yourself a pat on the back. Go ahead and share, like, and subscribe. Just do it. You don't have to be afraid. It'll be, it'll be like a little dream. You'll awake and you'll be subscribed and you'll have no pain and we'll have tea parties in the red room for Forever. If you're interested in a more in-depth and more spoilery discussion of Midnight Mass, I'm going to do a bonus video on Patreon talking about it because I have a lot of things to say and not enough time here to talk about it. On Patreon, you can also get early access to videos, monthly Q&As, TV reviews, and more! And how! You can join the Skip Introverts today! Or tomorrow! Or never. It's, it's really your choice. I can't make you do anything. Or can I? No. No, I, I, I can't. <laughs>